Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Daniels on Research. I'm David Daniel. I'm Daniel Willingham. This is the podcast where David and I find an article about education that we think is interesting and discuss it from the perspective, usually, of cognitive and developmental psychology. What do we got going today, David? So I found this one um, by Diane Ravitch. And what, what's interesting about it is the title, Why I Object to the Term Science of Reading. So I sent it over to you and I thought, this is one we gotta, we gotta do this about. Um, Cause there's, there's a lot in there that really we can discuss that I think would be really valuable just for me and you to discuss. Absolutely, <laughs> so yeah. Other people can watch too, right? Yeah. <laughs> Both of us, have, as people uh, listen or watch this, uh, this series of discussions no, we're, or have actually read some of what we've written, uh, you and I both have a strong interest in the relationship between basic science and education and sort of at a theoretical level, what does science mean for practice? Right. And I have a huge radar up for people who are using it for marketing purposes. Right. So when you see science of in front of anything, I'm like, whoop, let's yeah. look at this. <laughs> So start us off. What is the, what's the big, and to be clear, I think we were calling it an article. This is actually a blog entry. Um, what's, what do you see as the big picture here that, uh, uh, that she's offering? Well, there's layers to it, right? So I thought we actually should start with the title. Okay. Um, science of reading. Can there be a science of reading? Is there a science of reading? And uh, well, I got three questions. And is that science of reading somehow useful for practice, for teaching right. reading? Right. right. Um, so she, there, she talked about science of this, science of that, science of that. And, and like one science of cooking, science of art, and so on. Right. Yeah. Science of vlogging. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, people, it's back in the day when we actually, when we met, when people were putting neuroscience in front of it, neuro this, neuro that, yeah. brain this, brain that. And that was basically relegated things to a marketing tool and, uh, ended up with what I was calling brain carnation, where people were reincarnating old ideas with putting brains in front of it to try to sell things they'd already thought of. Right. Um, and, you know, so science of is the new thing because science of learning took off right out, you know, after the brain base, it was science of learning. Uh, so I, I think she really has a point when she's saying, be careful when people put science of in front of something. Right. Yeah. Now, uh, that uh, we want to be careful about what we're uh, what we're saying it doesn't mean like we're anti-science and science is all smoke and mirrors. No, and just be, should, be yeah. careful of it that it's being used for the properly in, in in a way that's descriptive as opposed to obfuscating something. Yes. Uh, so let's get into where we think it's not obfuscating, where we think it can valuable be valuable. Um, one distinction I think is really important is the distinction between the science of reading and the science of teaching reading. Not at all the same thing. Um, do you want to get into that a little bit? Should I take it from here? Well, I could start off a little bit um, because I've just published an article talking about the science of teaching, perpetrating the exact sin I'm against. Okay. Um, and one of the arguments in there, and, and uh, this is also made in this blog, is that science of in front of something, like I said, doesn't necessarily determine something, but does science pertain to practice and how do, how do they connect? And that's a really interesting to think about. Can scientific findings from basic science all the way down to applied science, um, in, should they influence practice? And is practice, does it lend itself well to science? Yeah. Right? And my idea for that is always, um, is look at meteorology. We it's, it's such a complex set of variables that we're looking at. We still can't predict the weather very well sometimes. Weather makes its own weather even. It's incredible. Um, just because it's complex doesn't mean it lends, doesn't lend itself to science. It doesn't lend itself to answers very easily. Right. It's, it's, we build the science. We get better over time. That's what science is for. Right. It's going to be probabilistic, not deterministic. Yeah. Uh, so you're, I see you're on babysitting duty. I am on babysitting duty. Sorry. So when you see me scrambling over here, everybody, that's what's that's what's going on over here. Um, yeah. And so to elaborate on that further, I mean, this distinction between science, when, when you're talking about basic science versus something else, let's be real clear about what we're talking about. Basic science is descriptive. You are describing the world as it is. So can you have a science of reading? Absolutely. And what that science would be is a description of the mental processes that are deployed and mental representations that are deployed when people are reading. 
Um, and this has been a very rich area of investigation. From, and so you're figuring out things like, how do we program eye movements when you're an experienced reader? Eye movements are extremely complex when you're, um, when you're a good reader. Um, how does you know, knowledge of the world get deployed on, when you're um, reading uh, a text in the newspaper or something like that? You have all this knowledge that you know about um, the topic that you're reading about. How does that sort of get melded into the information that's in the text? So that would be the science of reading. The science of teaching reading is something altogether different. Well, let's not um, confuse them first off, right? So we want to emphasize that. Exactly. Right? So you're making a really, really important distinction. Exactly. There's a science that pertains to reading. Exactly. Um, that science may or may not, depending on where we go with this, um, be a science of teaching reading. Right. So is it useful for teaching reading? Probably. Right. Um, but the question is, is there a science of teaching reading? Right. Which is a separate thing that, that the blog doesn't quite tease out. As exactly. Well. Yeah. But, Very important distinction that I think is missing. Um, and to be fair, is missing from many of these uh, discussions. It's not something uh, most people are used to thinking about. So science of teaching reading is going to be um, concerned. The, a, a fundamental difference is, first of all, it's going to be goal driven. You have to, whereas uh, in basic science, you're just trying to describe the world as it is. In an applied science like teaching, you're trying to change the world somehow. So in this obvious case, we've got kids who don't know how to read and we want to literally change their minds in some way. We want to make them capable of reading. Um, and you know you can approach that in different ways. You can have different goals about um, what you emphasize and like how much do you care about facility with reading versus how much do you care that kids end up loving reading and different schools you know balance those different factors in, in different ways. Um, so yeah, so let, let's let's get a little bit more into uh, what science can do for the teaching of reading. How do we, how do we think about that, about this, this question of the relationship? So we've got all this basic science, then we've got this goal that we want to move kids towards. We're already acknowledging the fact that that goal is, gonna, is, is outside the realm of science. That's a matter of values, of what kind of reader I want kids to end up um, being. So we're acknowledging that, but now, so that's off the table for science. What can science do basic science do when it comes to um, moving kids along towards whatever goal we set? Well, that's going to be in your purview. I mean, you wrote a book on it. But the, um, the, the interesting thing to me is, is the impression that people can get that because it's science, it's somehow deterministic, yeah. or that because the word science is there, this is what everybody should do. So right. um, before we go with what, what is out there, um, before, we want to say, well, how do you use what is out there? Right. And this gets me to this, this thing that, you know, if you end up watching this, uh, these discussions between Dan and I, I'm going to talk about it all the time. Um, the goal of research for practice is not best practices. It's a, um, it, it, best practices assume a very stagnant teacher is delivery system model, number one, like, like some sort of, you know, you go from the cook to, to, the, to the table and that's the role of the teacher. And that's not true. And that's very clear in this, this, this blog that we're talking about is, is she's really honoring the role of a teacher as a skilled professional that brings right. something to the table besides your dinner. Right. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, and I, just to interrupt, I'm sorry, I don't want to break your train of thought, but I think what you just said is so important. Um, yeah, I mean, I felt like that was the impetus behind the blog was that um, she was taking the role the, or the goal of science to be to tell every teacher what to do. And I strongly suspect that she has read, you know, tweets and, and other things on the internet where people are using science as a cudgel um, or as a marketing tool, as you described, to say, like, this is the way you teach reading. There's only one right way, and science has proven that it's the right way. Well, I'm not just tweets. I've actually published several articles where I take the recommendations that researchers from controlled settings have said, this is what you should do in a classroom, and show that it doesn't work once you get into the messy world of a real classroom. Yeah. Um, so it's a matter of, of where your expertise and what kind of – have you, have you built a bridge um, from – from the lab to practice? Have you made it for ubiquitous use? Have you made it adaptable for different contexts? There's a whole bunch of things we could talk about at some point with that. But so the, given that we're in a complex system and we have teachers who are individuals, they're more like the cooks, not the servers, 
right? So the, the goal of science really should be to provide really good ingredients to the knowledge of how they interact with each other. So the teacher can go to the cupboard when they need to do something and know what those ingredients are, know, and know from their experience, from their craft knowledge, everything, what works in the past. There's this new thing out. Maybe I'll put a little bit of this, this stevia in there instead of sugar and see how that works. Um, but we want to provide, as scientists, really, really good solid ingredients with the, the side effects and the potential you know, things they elevate, as much information as possible so those teachers really can go to the cupboard and bring the best they can to their students. And, and that's not a best practice. That's good ingredients. Right. So that, let's, let's talk a little bit about where scientists are going to come up with those ingredients. Um, I've described two broad classes of ways that basic science can help in an applied setting. One is you have findings from basic science that provide inspiration for new practices that people maybe hadn't thought of. So in the case of reading, you see, gee, kids who have really uh, uh, robust phonemic awareness, when you start trying to teach letter sound correspondences to them, they seem to have a much easier time than kids who don't have very good phonemic awareness. Let's see what happens if we try and actually teach kids phonemic awareness rather than just having them, right? So that would be a case where you have a scientific finding and that serves as inspiration for a new practice that you try. The second broad class is where you've got practices that are already in place. Uh, they were probably not inspired by science. Somebody just thought it was a good idea. It was intuitive or it was tradition or whatever it was. And then you use methods that were first developed in the sciences to evaluate them rather than just sort of saying like, well, I just sort of watch and see whether or not it works. You're sort of recognizing, you know what? My memory is a problem. I have, there's the problem of the fact that I kind of expect it to work. And so if it's ambiguous about whether or not it works, I'll probably give the situation the benefit of the doubt, blah, blah, blah. People are familiar with this. Uh, so science gives you a set of tools to better evaluate what the consequences of an intervention are. Um, so those are, the, those are where I would suggest the ingredients would come from, and they lead to different, uh, different I, don't, I don't know if I would say types of knowledge, but knowledge where we've got different levels of confidence from a scientific perspective, so let, that let's, it's an let, ingredient let, let, that's really important. Yeah, let me interrupt there for a second, yeah. because that, that assumes that the, te that the teacher uh, thinks science is a good way to to gather evidence. And in this, in this um, blog, it was really interesting. The, the writer was talking about good teachers. They use their knowledge and judgment to glean practice, study, and experience, right? Um, and if, you, if you're assessing the impact of that, those are hypotheses, and the impact is actually data. Right. right. So um, to say that teachers aren't scientists, that's true. To say that scientists aren't teachers, more true. Right. Um, but the, the important thing to think about is what tools are you going to use to, to, to decide what in that cupboard works well and what doesn't. Um, and a great idea, a great, a great um, way to think about this is I can go to the cupboards and bring out ice cream and potato chips and the kids are going to love it. My classroom is going to rock. And there's not one bit of nutrition in any of that. So we, we don't just need something that tastes good. We need something that's nutritional that actually gets to learning goals, right? Um, how am I going to judge what's nutritional? I have to have some sort of standard. That would be basically lend itself well to using the scientific method in, 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 as a process for evaluating, is my practice effective? How can I tweak it? How can I make it better? How can I evolve it? How can I work with this kid? Because this kid not, is not working the way the other kids are working. Those are all hypotheses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and again, to, to go back to um, a point we were making earlier on, when you said, um, I'm evaluating it, you're evaluating it in light of its efficacy of moving you toward that goal. And again, the goal is going to be defined outside of, you know, science has nothing to do with defining that goal. That's a goal that is, um, you know, there are other institutions that are figuring that out. Yeah, it's, it's a process. Right. Um, I think there's one other distinction that you and I made in an article from, I think, 2012 um, that I think is very relevant here when we're talking about, and I was sort of alluding to it when I said there are different um, uh, levels of confidence that scientists have on whether they think this ingredient's probably really important when you're cooking up your recipe, maybe you really want this ingredient to be part of it versus 
yeah, you know, here's an ingredient we've come up with. And if you like it, then great. And if it's not part of your recipe, then, then that's cool too. You and I refer to these as must-haves versus could-dos. And the, the idea of a must-have was there are, and we're, I think you and I are on the same page here, we're extremely cautious and modest about how many of these scientists have discovered. But there's a handful of um, aspects of learning that are absolutely essential for common uh, school-related tasks. So knowing letter uh, uh, sound correspondences in, in, uh, in the course of learning how to read is something that we would categorize as a must have. Yeah. Um, and again, a must have just basically means like, you know, you could, you could try and meet this goal, but if all the scientific evidence indicates it's going to be extraordinarily difficult, if not possible, uh, impossible to meet that goal, uh, without this particular ingredient. So that's the must haves. Why don't you, uh, say something about the could do's. Well, could do's are things that look promising and that um, if you did it, it may actually help you out, right? You could do these things. You don't mm -hmm. have to, right. um, but there are things that could facilitate. And, and by the way, everything has side effects. So it could facilitate some and, and suppress other sorts of things, but there are things you could do to see if it works for you. Right. And, and science can point the way toward those sorts of things. Right. And very often the could do's are ways of getting towards the must haves. They're things that, uh, uh, so the must haves are not really optional. One way or another, you've got to make this happen in your classroom. The could do's are sort of proven ways or um, proven is too strong, but you know what I mean? Ways for which there is uh, pretty good evidence. Yeah, there's the data um, supported. In, I'm data. sorry? Data supported. Data right. supported, yeah. Ways that in many contexts, this has been a helpful practice to get to uh, to get to one of the must-haves. Yeah, and it's really important to think about that because, you know, I work across different cultures and the, 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 the must-haves um, we would hope would work across all these contexts, but the could-dos would be really different across classrooms, yeah. cultures, all, all these sorts of things. Um, but they, they seem to ele elevate things for the people we know about. And that's why the teacher is so important in these, you know, we keep we talking about teachers. Well, teachers are the essential ingredient here and we don't have a process to bridge the, the science to really, really great practice. Um, th so that, that all falls on the teacher at some point. And um, we need to have evidence generating teachers who actually can say, look, here's what I did and it, here, here, and, and it worked. And here's my evidence and let's go further and let's see. And we can increase the number of could do's exponentially by including them as part of the system. Right. And that would be, that would be so powerful for just the, the reason you mentioned. I mean, you mentioned culture. Also, the way I think about could do's is like, you know, you don't do a could do if you just feel like that's not the kind of thing I would do in my classroom. Like that doesn't feel like a good fit, uh, you know, for me as a teacher and how I present myself to my students and all that sort of thing. So you would love it if there were, and, and again, the, the, um, in terms of thinking about people using science sort of as, as a, a stick to hit people with and say, you've got to do it this way. I really have to object to that strongly. I mean, the uh, when you're talking about it, could do. It's exactly the kind of, it, it may be um, beautifully supported with all kinds of wonderful data. Uh, but if you don't, if you don't feel like doing it because it just doesn't feel right in your class and there's no reason to do it. But that's qualitatively different than the must haves business where it's like, yeah, like, you know, if you try and get people to expertise without practice, I really don't care what your personality as a teacher is. Like, you know, you have to practice. The human mind has to practice to gain proficiency. Uh, all right, should we leave it there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, th thanks for letting me go through this. I just, I, it was some really interesting ideas in it that gave us a chance to talk about this. Yeah, absolutely. Good. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.